title of the sermon tonight is Beauty is Vain. Beauty is Vain. Of course, in Proverbs chapter 31, uh, this is a, a great list of, of attributes that uh, ladies should aspire to have. Now, I will say this about this chapter. This is something that is set up as a type of a bar to try and achieve. I mean, the woman that's being described here is, is, a, is a great woman, and these are things that I think sometimes ladies that are in church, they, they read this and they, they think, oh, I'm doing this, but I'm falling short here, and they, and they feel like they have to accomplish all these things. This is, a, I think, put in here as, again, as a standard to try and achieve, but it's not something that everybody's always going to just have down pat. It's something to, to aim for, basically, is, is what I'm saying. But it says there at the end, it says in verse uh, 29, Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Now, obviously, when you read chapter, uh, chapter uh, Proverbs 31, and you're going to preach on beauty being vain, you know, that's typically a sermon that you would preach for women. But, you know... Let's just get it, right out, get it right out in the open. Even today, there's a lot of men that are just obsessed with their looks. Right. I mean, it's, it's gotten ridiculous. So it's like now even we have to preach to the men that, you know, obsessing about your looks is vain. Yep. And this is something that, that, that men are falling into more and more. You know, they're constantly worried about how they look. They're prepping and preening. They're making sure all the, the, the clothes match. They have to have the ensemble put together before they walk out the door. I mean, I had friends like this growing up. I mean, he would take longer than my wife does to go anywhere. We'd be, it would like be like an hour of him just, you know, making sure he had the right cologne on and all the clothes matched. And he'd have to stand in front of the mirror and make sure the hat was just so before he walked out the door. And it was actually, you know what it is, is it's effeminate. You know, a man that sits there and spends so much time on his looks is an effeminate quality. Men should not be so obsessed with their looks. Not so obsessed with making sure everything matches. Now, this is where wives come in great for guys like me. <laughs> because I managed to walk out the door in something that looks like, okay, somebody helped him do that. You know, he, he matches. And one of, you know, one of the things about, you know, I'll tell you about my wife. One of the things that actually attracted her to me is the fact that I had no fashion style whatsoever. I had no clue <laughs> how to dress at all. You should see the picture that she had of me when she was, when she was crushing on me. She had taken this photo when I was working on the bus route and I'm coming off the bus and I'm standing next to my pastor and his son and she takes this picture. I mean, my hair is just completely out and like it's just all puffy. You know how my hair gets when I don't, when I don't cut it. I mean, the, the, stu the stuff on the neck's like coming around. I've got like a neck scarf practically going. You know, this is me as a single guy. This is the guy she's attracted. I'm shocked too, people. I, you know what I mean? And uh, I mean, I'm wearing the, I've got the, the tweed suit coat on with the leather. Uh, the leather elbows, you know, and the one guy in church would always mock me. He'd say, hey, professor, how you doing? I'm like, what are you talking about? And he'd just laugh at me. And it wasn't until I figured out it was like a professor's jacket for reading, you know. And then I had the vest, the woolen tweed vest underneath of it. And even that didn't match the, the coat. And the khaki pants that were too small. So, you know, the pockets start to kind of flare out like that. They get the, the little crimp because that that's how you know. You're, that's how I figured out. Well, that means your pants were too small when your pockets start to do that. One shoe in the photo, I'm not kidding, is literally untied. <laughs> you think I'm joking, it's the truth. And that's what was on her nightstand or whatever at her mom's house. And, you know, that was, that was the man of her dreams, you know. And after we started dating, I asked her about that. I said, why did you choose that photo? Because it's embarrassing. It makes a good ser sermon illustration now, but it was embarrassing at the time. And she said, because I looked at you, because she was a hairstylist for years, so she was used to these guys that were always coming in and, had to, you know, the pretty boys that had to just have everything just so. And she's like, I took one look at you and I knew you had, you were not that kind of guy. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's obvious. <laughs> I mean, my fashion style is go find something that fits like this. Like you'll notice in all the YouTube videos, blue shirt every time. <laughs> the only thing that changes is the tie. I had someone type like, how many times do you preach in a day? Someone commented. I'm like, I own several of the same shirt. <laughs> They're like, oh. Like, man, this guy just preaching constantly. How many times is he preaching a day? Like, no, I own five of these, okay? Five of these shirts, five of these pants, one suit coat. You know, it's one less thing I have to think about because I'm not, ex I'm not you know, obsessed by, you know, shocker. I'm not obsessed about my looks. You know, I don't care if, if, if people are going to say, you know, examine my attire and say, well, that, doesn't, that clashes. You know, that's not in style. I don't care because I'm not effeminate right. because I'm a man. 
And, and that's something, you know, when we start preaching about beauty being vain, unfortunately, even today, we have to bring it up and say, look, men, you know, be a man. Don't get so obsessed about your looks. Now, obviously, you know, they should at least make sure this is, you know, comb the hair and walk out. You know, that's, that's pretty much how I comb the hair, just real quick, and then we're done. We can walk out. We don't want to walk out looking like total slobs, obviously, but I'm just saying there's some guys out there, they're just, they're just way into fashion. They're just spending way too much time worrying up, you know, making sure everything is name brand. They're getting it from the catalog, making sure everything, you know, got to get the designer shoes and the, the right everything and put, have a little ensemble put together. It's an effeminate attribute. Men should not have shoe closets. Okay, that's for women. And either, you know, even then, even the women, you know, who are just obsessed with fashion, you know, it's vain. Beauty is vain. That is what the Bible says. That if you're just obsessed with beauty, if you're just obsessed with having a look, you're spending your life on vanity. It's meaningless. It, 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 it's going to go away. It's not going to have any eternal value whatsoever. So <laughs> if you look here in Proverbs chapter 31, actually go over to 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter 9. And keep something in 2 Kings chapter 9. I'm going to add something in here real quick that I, I had before the service. Go over to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. <laughs> you know, people today get so obsessed with just trying to hide their flaws. You know, and, and people are, are, you know, so worried about what everybody else is going to think about how they look. And, uh, you know, here's the thing about having flaws. Whether it's a physical flaw or, you know, people have uh, speech flaws in their speech sometimes, or they have even disabilities, or there's something wrong with them. And every one of us, you know, has something wrong. You know, every one of us might have some kind of a physical flaw in our life. And here's what I want us to understand, is that having physical flaws, or, or any flaw really, is something that will actually make you a better person. Amen. People that have it all, all going for them, you know, they're just the best looking, they just have all the money, they just... Everything comes easy into them. They usually grow up to be rotten people True. because they can't sympathize with anybody. They don't have any humanity because they're just, well, I, I, I look good. I've got all this. They just have all this advantage and they just think, why doesn't everybody else? <coughs> now, obviously, that's not always the case. People can, you know, be all that and still be good people, but often it does ruin people. So don't, don't get so obsessed about trying to hide your flaws or or obsessing about it or trying to cover it up or making sure nobody else notices some flaw that you might have because that flaw that you might get picked on about or teased over might actually be what God uses to make you a better person. Yeah. Look in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, look at verse 1. It says, a good name is better than precious ointment. You know, more, better than, you know, having the, 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 the right cologne or the right perfume or having the right scent is to have a good name. You know, maybe that guy doesn't smell the best, but man, he's a good guy. You know, maybe, he, maybe he's not the best looking guy, but you know what? He's somebody that I can confide in. He's somebody that can, I can trust. He's somebody that's going to be there. He's a good person. He's a good man. It says, a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than one of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Look, it's vanity. I mean, that's what Ecclesiastes is all about. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. And the Bible says that beauty, or an obsessing about beauty, is vanity. And why is that? Because the end of all men is to go to the house of mourning. The end of all men is death. And look, I don't care how good looking you might think you are today, but when you get old, you're not going to be good looking. <laughs> Everyone starts out good looking. And then it's just, you know? <laughs> So it's vanity to sit there and obsess about something. I'm going to just sit here and try and improve on something that I didn't even do anything to achieve. I'm just going to sit here and try to just obsess and make my life all about and improve something that's just going to continually go downhill, my looks. I didn't do anything to earn them except be born. And then you just make your life all about that. And it's something that's just going to get harder and harder to maintain, something that's going to get farther and farther away until one day you're going to wake up and you know what? You're going to, you're going to go the way of all the earth. And you're going to get wrinkly and old and gray and that's the, that is the end of all men look at verse 3 it says sorrow is better than laughter sorrow is better than laughter and that's what the bible says for by the sadness of the countenance of the heart is the heart is made better 
by the sadness, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. He's saying, look, it's better to, to, to mourn and to weep and to be sorrow and to be sorrowful than to always be happy, to always be laughing, and to have everything to go just go perfectly in your life. Because by that, the countenance of your heart is made better. You are made better by suffering. And whenever we go through things in life that are hard and difficult or even tragic or we have some kind of a flaw or there's something that we're always picked on about, you know, we should thank God for that because that's going to be the thing that God uses to make you a better person. That's something that God is going to use to change the countenance of your heart and make you better. You know, since I'm kind of picking on myself already, I'll just continue in that vein. <laughs> it, you know, not only was I a poor dresser, <laughs> I was also as skinny as a rail up to the time I was about 25. And now I know that's hard to believe, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I deserve that. <laughs> it's true, though. I was uh, about to the time I was about, right about I turned 25, you know, metabolism changes. But I was like 160, 170 pounds. Same height. I'm not going to tell you what I weigh today. Okay. <laughs> But when I was growing up, um, you know, I was just a real skinny kid. And my, my dad, my nickname was Toothpick. Hey, Toothpick, come here. Hey, Toothpick. I mean, all the way through my teen years, everything, it was just Toothpick. You know, that used to bother me, you know. And people used to make comments, man, you're so skinny. Why don't you put some muscle on and, and whatever, you know. And I used to, it used to bother me. But, you know, and then apparently <laughs> something changed. I went from Toothpick to, like, bowling pin, I guess. That's what you call me now, right? You know, just brr. So... But you know what? That being called that and going through that and being picked on and being teased, you know, it made me more like uh, it made me a better person. You know, I'm not trying to brag on myself, but now when I see other people kind of, you know, that are shy about their appearance or they feel like they're getting picked on, you know, what? I can I can, uh, you know, sympathize with that person. And I'm less likely to do that to somebody else except for Adam, you know? <laughs> Because he can take it. We, we go back and forth. But you know, I don't, I, I'm less likely to pick on people that are sensitive about things. Right. You know, I'm not going to go around mocking people for their physical appearance. Because I've been through that. You know, maybe that's why God let me grow up a toothpick and turn into a bowling pin. You know, to, to try and, you know, keep me humble. But if you would, go back to 2 Kings chapter 9. Because again, the title of the sermon is Beauty is Vain. So we're just talking about the vanity of beauty. And, and typically this is something that, that, that deals more with women. Because women, you know, they, they're more concerned with their looks typically than men are. <coughs> and so I just want to kind of talk about this tonight and just and look at a couple things. But it said there in Proverbs 31 that, that favor is deceitful. You know, when people are favored because of their looks... They can become deceitful people. They can actually use their good looks to, to fool people and to confuse people and to, to flatter people even. But it says there that uh, favor is de deceitful and beauty is vain. So having good looks is something that, that deceitful people can actually use to their advantage. And, you know, you will see this with women. Women will use their good looks to kind of, you know, get an advantage over people. This, this does happen. And I think a great example of this is, uh, you know, in 2 Kings there, the woman Jezebel. Now, there's another example we won't look at, you know, Delilah, you know, who brought down the mighty Samson. You know, if we all know that story. I don't think Samson went looking for an ugly woman. I think he went looking for a good-looking woman. I think Delilah was probably very nice to look at. I don't know how she dressed and all that, or, but she seduced him, you know, and she used her favor... She used her beauty to, what, be deceitful and to bring down a mighty man of God. You know, in 2 Kings chapter 9, uh, if, you, if you know who Jezebel is in the scripture, she's a wicked woman, the wife of Ahab, who, who did many terrible things in Israel. But it says in 2, 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 30, when Jehu came to Jezreel, and I remember who Jehu was, he was anointed by Elijah to go, to, to go and, and to you know, bring the wrath of God and vengeance upon the house of Ahab, and he did that. And this is probably, you know, maybe, maybe I'm a little macabre up here, but this is probably one of my more favorite stories. Whenever I read this, I just, especially this section, because Jezebel had it coming. I mean, she's trying to kill Elijah. She's turning Israel over the prophets of Baal. She's a wicked woman. I mean, we read about her this morning, right, where she, t she went and killed uh, Naboth, right, Naboth, Naboth's vineyard. She brought, out, she brought in the sons of Belial and she had him bear false witness and had an innocent man killed so her husband could grow some herbs somewhere. This is a wicked woman. 
Okay, So she's got what's coming here in this passage. And it says in verse 30, And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, after he's just cleaning house, you know, uh, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face. So this is the, she's heard that, oh, Jehu's coming, and he's, gonna, he's cleaning house. He's going to wreck. You know, she's, he's bringing, he's just going to wreck some people. Because that's what he's been on. He's on the war path. So what does she do? Does she put ashes on her head and get some burlap on and try to repent? No, she paints her face. And that's interesting. She painted her face. It's talking about she put on makeup and tired her head and looked out at a window. Now, here's the thing about makeup. You know, I, th I think this is like a personal standard. People can wear whatever kind of makeup they want. But here, you know, here's the thing about makeup. You got to be careful with it. You know, ladies, you know, that shouldn't apply to any men. <laughs> if it is, you know, there's the door. <laughs> Here, here's the thing, you know, you know, I get that ladies want to doll themselves up and make themselves look nice. And I think that's, you know, every man has to decide what he wants his wife to do or what every man is going to let allow what his daughters are going to do in this area. But the one word of advice is this. Don't, you know, what was, how did that song go? Uh, you better go light on the powder and the paint or you'll end up looking like something you ate. You know, and that's the truth. You know, you, you put on all the makeup to cover everything up. You know, my wife used to wear makeup. And, and she, she was, you know, I hope she doesn't mind me sharing this. I probably should have asked her. <laughs> Poor lady, she goes through so much <laughs> having me up here. <laughs> hey, I've been picking on me. She can share a little bit in my agony, right? Because, you know, ladies, they have what's called blemishes. This is a term I've learned, okay? We all know what a blemish is. If, if, you've, if, if you're a lady or you've, if you've been married to one. And she would, she'd say, hey, I don't want to wear all this gaudy makeup, can I, but is it okay if I just, you know, cover my blemish? So that's fine with me, go ahead. You know, and uh, what she found, though, is when she actually quit using the makeup is the blemishes went away. I mean, irony of ironies, when you actually quit wearing makeup, you don't need it anymore. I don't know where I'm going with all that, but it's worth noting right there that this woman, Jezebel, who was wicked, the first thing she thought of when she realized that God was going to bring the hammer down was paint her face. Why? Because she's trying to be deceitful. She's trying to win people over with her beauty. And tired her head. I mean, she's, she's doing up her hair. And then she goes to the window. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace who slew his master? And I love his response. And he lifted up his, his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? He doesn't even respond to her. He just goes, All right, who's on my side? Who? Right? And there looked out, the, out, out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, Throw her down. <laughs> this is a great story. I'm going to read it because I love the story. <laughs> throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trod her underfoot. So she's coming. She's like, oh, I got him right where I want him. She's got herself all dolled up. Had Zimri peace who slew his master? You know, she's just noodle-necking up there. And he doesn't even respond. He just says, who's on my side? Oh, we are. Throw her down. And then when she just <laughs> splat. <laughs> Blood goes everywhere, and he just trod her underfoot. I mean, who needs all these Hollywood movies? This stuff's great. This really happened. This is good stuff. People, and you say, oh, the Bible's so crude. You know what? You like it plainer than that on your television. Yeah. You like it plainer than that at the movie theater. Right. Oh, the Bible's so crude. You know, it, whatever. You know, go watch another blow em up blood and guts horror movie. Right. Amen. <laughs> so he said, uh, so he, he, then he just tro trod her underfoot. He's like, not only is she just dead, splattered all over the pavement, and then he's just like, run over her with the chariot. And when he was coming, he did eat and drink. I mean, the guy just didn't even, have it, didn't even bother him a bit. Runs her right over. Why? Because she's a wicked woman, and she had it coming. Yeah. And he said, go, now this, go see uh, now this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went to bury her. And they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by the servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall the dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel. So that they shall say, not, they shall say, so they shall not say, This is Jezebel. I mean, that was the end of that wicked woman. And she went out looking pretty good. And she went out, she was all dolled up, but it didn't do any good. What she was trying to do was be deceitful. Because favor and beauty is deceitful. And people will use this to their advantage. And, you know, it's unfortunate because our culture puts emphasis on women being physically attractive above everything else. Above everything else. 
the objectification of women is what our culture teaches. And they say a woman has no worth other than the way she looks. That's our culture. Can I get an amen? That's the way it is. <coughs> they put an emphasis on a woman being attractive rather than a woman being godly. Yep. Rather than a woman being a 30, Proverbs 31 woman. What they want a woman to be is this, this, this uh, preconceived notion of beauty. They want women to have a certain figure and have a certain look and act a certain way. And if they're not that, then they're of no worth. Yep. You know? And you know what? That's not God's standard. God's standard is not the, the, the way you look because that's vanity. God's standard is your character, your heart, your spirit, your service to God, your, the way you live your life, things that have lasting real value. That's where God puts the emphasis. You know, our culture puts it in the completely wrong place. The Bible says, as a jewel of gold and a swine's snout, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. I mean, that verse has always stuck with me for a very long time. You know, when I was starting to look for, you know, because when I was single, you know, and I was kind of looking for a wife and, and wanting to know what to look for, I made sure that, you know, now, obviously, I <laughs> did fairly well because I got a beautiful wife. <coughs> I did, you know, and, uh, but I made sure, I said, look, that's not going to be the determining factor. Now, I think you should probably marry somebody that you're attracted to. You should, and, you know, th that's because that's a big part of marriage. But I'm just saying this, that that is not the most important thing in life. And, and, and women that are just going to be all about their looks and leave off everything else, it's like, putting a, it's, like, it's, like a, it's like a swine putting a jewel of gold in its nose and forgetting about the rest of itself. Forgetting about, you know, everything else, all the other ugliness and, 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 and the filth that it wallows in and all the other character flaws and everything else that it has. And it's just worried about the fairness, the beauty. It's like a pig just, you know, like, oh, making sure that they have this, this little jewel of gold in its nose. And not only that, but, you know, another way you can look at that verse is that it's kind of a waste. It's kind of a waste. And it'd be great if you had, you know, uh, uh, the, had the beauty and the character. You know, you had the jewel of gold instead of a swine. You know, you had that jewel of gold somewhere where it belongs. So, <coughs> you know, we should not put the emphasis like, the cul like our culture does on women being on, on beauty only. But women should seek to be godly. They should seek to be holy. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. That's what that jewel of gold in a swine's snout is. It's women trying to decorate something ugly they're trying to make up for something else that's lacking poor character a lack of godliness a lack of the attributes that the bible teaches we should have that ladies should have look at first peter chapter three and you know who can blame them because they're i mean the the culture pushes that and they're being taught from just little girls what 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 really matters by the world they're not teaching them that you know that they're certainly not telling them to be subject to their husbands Unless something's changed out there, but I'm, I'm certain that's not the case anymore. Right. You know, feminism is just running amok. Right. He says here in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by their conversation with wives. Now, you just, you'd, you'd lose people right there. Go preach that at ASU. Go preach that on some college campus somewhere, that women are to be subject to their own husbands. You'd get run out of town on a rail. And women, they, they bucket that. I've known, women, I've known pastors who's told me that they've gone to passages like that where it says women are to obey their own husbands. And they walk right up to the pastor and say, oh yeah, I, blocked, I scratched that right out of my Bible. Say, so look what I did, preacher. I took a black marker and I went, because eh, I don't like that. Well, shame on you. That's too bad. You know, you're gonna, you're, you know what you are probably trying to do is you're probably going to go home and put a jewel of gold on a swine snout. Instead of trying to actually live what the Bible says, you're going you're gonna to try and, you know, instead of actually take care of what really needs to be dolled up and decorated, you're going to just emphasize on everything that doesn't matter. Looks, beauty, vanity. <clears throat> he says, Wives, be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, 
while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel. He's saying, don't let the adorning in your life be everything that's external. Ladies, don't make your life everything about just what can be seen with the eye. Don't get obsessed with beauty because it's vanity. <clears throat> but let it be the hidden man of the heart. That's what ladies should be. That's because that's not vanity. When ladies are actually trying to adorn the inner man in Christ. Because that, that, and that which is not corruptible. That's what's going to last. Yep. That's what's going to carry on through eternity. You know, and, and ladies have a hard time with some of this stuff sometimes. But, you know, there's a reward for the, all this. That's right. And I think there's going to be a lot of godly women who did their, did their part scripturally, obeyed the word of God, they're going to get to heaven and outshine a lot of men. They're going to outshine probably a lot of preachers. Because it takes a lot to do that. It takes a lot of humility. It takes a real spirituality to actually practice this. He's saying, look, let it be the hidden man in the heart, which is, in, which is that, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. The Bible says that when a woman has a meek and quiet spirit, the world would mock at that. The world would laugh and say, oh, you're a doormat. Obey your husband. Pfft. Girl, it's, it's, it's a new world. Yes, we can. <laughs> That's what they'd say. They'd laugh at you if you said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be, be subject to my own husband and have a meek and quiet spirit. Oh, you're so oppressed. That's what the world would tell you. But what God says is it's of great price. It's invaluable. You can't put a number on it. <clears throat> so we should, you know, ladies need to get, get, make sure that, you know, they're not spending their life in vanity. Trying to just, you know, adorn everything that's external. Now I'm not saying they have to, you know, you know stop doing their hair and putting on something nice. Every, every, you know, all the ladies don't need to show up next church service, just hair some mess, and like, oh, I'm just adorning the inward man, brother, you know. <laughs> just completely let everything go. I'm not saying that. I get it. You know, everyone thinks, and when you preach this, they all think, oh, you just want me to wear some little house on the prairie dress or something. Do you know you can still be a godly, you dress like a godly woman and still look nice and still be, you know, fashionable? And I remember my wife, she struggled with that. When she first started getting in church, she'd say, I, I can't wear some of these dresses that some of these ladies wear, like the grandma floral prints and everything. <laughs> some people can pull it off. My wife wasn't into it. Then she met some ladies that, could, that wore, you know, some, some nice stuff, some hip stuff, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. And she realized, look, you could, it's, not, it's not one extreme or the other, that you can dress like a godly young woman and that you can... You know, still ordain the, the, inward, uh, the inward man, you know, and not look like you just are, like you're going to aunt doubt on the Oregon Trail, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> so what should women do who want to ordain the inward man? If there's ladies out there today, you know, that want to, or, uh, you know, ordain the inward man, they say, you know, I agree with you that, you know, all of the external is just vanity. And I'm tired of just spending my life chasing vanity, something that just keeps fleeing away from me. Year after year, it gets harder and harder to just, you know, try to make myself look the certain way and just spend your life chasing beauty, which is vanity. Where, where do I start? I agree with you. Well, he says there, likewise, ye wives. You know, and this would apply, obviously, to the ladies that aren't, sing that aren't married. You know, marriage would be a good start. You know, find a godly man and get married. Be in subjection. You know, that takes, that's an adorning of the inward man. Being in subjection to your own husbands. May, let him rule the house and call the shots and be the boss. You know, and again, I pre I've already preached on this recently about men. You know, men need to do that. That's a great responsibility. Right. And if men fail to do that, you, know, you can't really blame a woman for, for you know, filling that vacuum. You, you say, oh, she's running the house. Yes, yeah, she is, but maybe that's because the man isn't what he needs to be. Right. Because somebody's got to lead. Somebody has to, and if the man's not going to do it, the woman will step up and do it. It's really not her fault. Now, that's not always the case. Someone, you know, sometimes the, the, the women, they, they're going to rule no matter what. You know, they're just, they're just going to put their foot down, and a real man would put a stop to that. You say, how? how? You know, well, <laughs> that's another sermon. 
<laughs> if you don't know, then look, any real man knows how, okay? But he says, be in subjection. It takes humility, right? That's an, ordain that's an adorning of the inward man, ladies. And that's not vain. The world might mock at it. The world might scoff and call you a doormat or whatever. But God says, that's, in my sight, that's of great price. Chaste conversation. You know, learn what is appropriate. You know, learn how to say what's appropriate and not say inappropriate things. Have a chaste conversation. I mean, today people talk, it's like people are just, they just talk about anything and everything they want to anymore. It's like, it seems like just some subjects are just no holds barred. And you know, I'm just going to say it. I don't think it's been a problem here, but I, it has happened and it never should. So a little preventative maintenance right now. You know, bedroom talk is not proper conversation, right. even between ladies, ever. And you say, who would ever do that? It happens. That kind of talk should never take place among men or women. That's a very private thing. That's a very, uh, you know, that, that should be kept between husband and wife. Right. And if you, if you ever hear somebody talking like that, you should rebuke them sharply. Yep. And say, I don't want to hear that. You keep that to yourself. Chaste conversation. Learn what is appropriate to say and what it isn't. That's an, ordain, that's an or, uh, adorning of the inward man. Meek and quiet spirit. You know, learn, learn to let your husband be your voice. <gasps> Yeah. There, I said it. You know, let your husband speak up for you. Let him lead. Adorning the hidden man. It's a lot easier to doll up the outward, though, isn't it? The world's not going to mock you for that. The world's not going to ridicule you if you spend your whole life just chasing vanity and ordaining the outward man. They're going to say, good job. That's the way to do it right there. You, you show them. You go, girl. That's what they're going to say. And, you know, and, and people do that. Why? Because that's easier. Right. That's the easy way to just doll everything up. Now, I know it looks like I struggle, <laughs> right? But that's the truth. That's the easy, that would be the easy path. You know, let me just invest in the outward. It's a lot harder at, to adorn the inward man, but it's also much more valuable. And quite frankly, it makes you a much more beautiful person. Yep. You see some ladies, that, you know, you, you see some ladies, she's, you know, just some babe, just some good-looking woman. And I often I'll think to myself, I wonder what she's like to talk to. I wonder if you could stand 30 seconds with her. I wonder what, you know, what she's read lately. <laughs> I wonder how deep the intellect really goes there. You know, here's what ladies that need to ask themselves. Whose eye do you want to catch? Whose eye do you want to catch tonight? Do you want to catch the world's eye? Do you want to catch some stranger's eye? Which I've never understood. You know, and I, I think a lot, of, a lot of ladies don't understand this, is that men are looking. <laughs> they think, oh, I'm just going to dress this way because it feels nice and it just makes me look pretty. And th they don't realize how many heads are turning and looking. Total strangers just Googling or, 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 or ogling or Googling or whatever you want to call it and looking at you, staring at you. <laughs> I don't, I mean, who would want that? And then there's ladies that do want that. And that's really weird. They say, oh, I'm going to put this on and I'm going to go out and turn some heads. Well, enjoy it while it lasts. And go ahead and uh, or, 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 you know, uh, or, uh, adorn the outward woman. Uh, adorn the outward man. Put all that on and enjoy it while it lasts. But you know what? It's going to get harder and harder to do. And eventually, it doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to turn a single head. And then what have you got? Right. Nothing. So why don't you, instead of doing that, start adorning the inward man, yep. which maybe nobody in the world will notice. It'll catch God's eye. Right. Whose eye do you want to catch tonight? The world, some man's, some strangers? Or do you want to get God's eye? You want him to look down and say, I'm pleased with that. That's what we want to see. <coughs> but it's easier to doll up that, the outward. And the woman who adorns the, out, uh, the inward man is going to go unacknowledged by the world. You know, I'm not holding my breath waiting for, you know, the, the, the Miss Virtuous America pageant. <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen. There's not going to be like, all right, for our next category, you know, we're going we're gonna to have the, uh, the, uh, the skirt and the, 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 the skirt show where they come out, you know, just godly dressed, walk out and turn around. Oh, everyone's like, oh, that's so modest. 
<laughs> is that what the world does? No, it's, it's the bikini contest. That's what they do. There's not going to be, you know, the, some pageant where they say, okay, let's see, let's see how good you are at sewing. <laughs> how, 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 well do you, how many nutritious meals do you know how to prepare for your family? That world's not going to, no one's impressed by that in the world. Right. Oh, let's see how well you can teach your children how to read or mathematics or history. That's hard work. That's really hard work. The world doesn't care. They say, oh, just, just send them off and let the world, we'll teach them that. You just, you just worry about your looks. We'll take care of that for you. There's no pageant for Miss Vir Virtuous America. And if Miss America had, you know, all these godly categories, they'd pull it off the air. Because that's not what the world wants to see. But here's the thing. Truly godly women who are, are serious about ordaining, or I keep saying that, adorning, 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 not ordaining, adorning the inward man, truly godly women that want to just adorn the inward man, they don't mind going unnoticed by the world. They don't care. It doesn't bother them. They don't care if they never make some magazine cover or they, you know, turn some heads out in the world. They don't care. They'd rather go unnoticed. They'd rather have shamefacedness and sobriety, right. as the Bible says. <coughs> Go back to Proverbs 31. I should have had you stay there. Well, who's going to notice me? Who's going to notice if I just make my life all about adorning the inward man? Well, God for one. God for one. The Lord will notice and bless you for it. But, you know, that's, there are going to be some people in your life who will appreciate you adorning the inward man, ladies. If you don't just spend your life in vanity chasing physical beauty. If you don't just make your whole life about just trying to put some jewel on a, snow, a swine snout, but actually try to do something of value and live a, as a virtuous, godly woman. Look at Proverbs chapter 31, verse 28. Who, here's whose heads you're going to turn if you adorn the inward man. Her children arise up and called her blessed. I mean, how many ladies can say that today? That they've got children that, that bless their mother, that appreciate their mother for investing in them, for spending, you know, instead of being so worried about just chasing their appearance or whatever, that they actually take the time to teach them and instruct them and be a godly example to them. You know, it might not happen when they're just little ones, when they don't know any better. But, you know, children in the Bible can also mean grown children. You know, there's going to be some ladies, you know, that if they spend their time adorning the inward man, they're going to raise some kids that one day are going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, appreciate what their mothers did for them, they're going to turn around, they're going to rise up and say, you're blessed. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to, to teach me and instruct me. Thank you, Mom, for adorning the inward man and not getting caught up in vanity and neglecting me. So there's one eye that you can catch. Your own kids. How about this one? Her husband also, and he praiseth her. You know, my husband doesn't appreciate me. Well, is there anything to appreciate? Ask yourself that. Is there anything to appreciate? Or is it just a bunch of outward, outward that, or is it just, you know, because there's a lot of other men appreciating it, saying, thanks for dressing like that. Right. Appreciate it. <coughs> or do you want, your, you want your husband to praise you? Well, then maybe it's time to adorn the inward man and not make it all about the external, not chasing be beauty because beauty is vain. <coughs> 